Good morning and welcome to Trinity Reformed Church. Our call to worship comes from the 18th Psalm this morning. It reads, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock, but the God of my salvation be exalted. Come. You are here to worship God, your Heavenly Father, through His Son, Jesus Christ. He is with you now. Come and worship. Now please open your Bibles with me now to Hebrews chapter 2. You'll notice that is not the book of Daniel. We will be finishing up Daniel uh, next week. Um, But today we are looking at Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 through 18. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 through through 18. Here is the word of God. For it was fitting for him, for whom all are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had power, had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, He does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Here is the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so privileged to have your word. Open our ears, open our hearts, that we might truly understand your will and your will alone. Lord, I pray that my words would be pleasing to you, that you would keep my lips from error. For it is you alone who should be glorified. Lord, we pray for your glory now in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Hebrews begins by showing us Jesus' suffering and the fact that through those sufferings, He is the foundation of our salvation. This morning, I'm looking deeper into those sufferings and the vast benefit that they provide to the believing Christian. The two things that must always be remembered when reading through the book of Hebrews is that this is a letter written to a group of Jewish Christians. And it's written to explain who and what Jesus is in his incarnation. It's in his humanity. The letter to the Hebrews is about things that could not happen without God coming as the Christ, God in fully human form. If you keep those two things in mind as you journey through this letter and ask yourself how what is written here relates to those two things, it will help to open the writings of Hebrews to you. How does what is written relate to the incarnation of Christ? 
Earlier in the letter, the writer makes it clear that Jesus died for all mankind. And that, even though this is the case, that doesn't mean that all men are saved, and in fact, they never will be. It was noted that Jesus is not ashamed to call those who are saved his brethren, that's his brothers. As the letter continues, the writer quotes Jesus as saying, Here am I. And the children whom God has given me, which are those elected to salvation. And then in verse 14 it reads, To the children that have partaken of flesh and blood. The first thing to note here is that the actual text reads, Blood and flesh. Now it may seem innocuous, it doesn't really make a difference to our ears, But to change the order did mean something to the Jews. Flesh and blood, to the Jewish mind, referred to the futility of life or the powerlessness of man against God, whereas blood and flesh had to do with the physical state of man, the God-given life of man. And all those who partake of blood and flesh are called children of God. The way that this is written looks all the way back to Adam, the first man. In other words, it's including, once again, all mankind, and that includes Jesus as well in his incarnation, in his his humanity. And so, of course, we read, he himself likewise shared in the same. And then we come across a slight problem. It says in our translations that through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil. There's a slight problem there because this is the Bible, the Word of God. And the Bible never says that the devil will be destroyed. That includes in here in Hebrews as well, actually. You can read about Satan's final destination in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, where it says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You'll notice that even there, at the end of all things as we know it, The devil is not destroyed. The question is, what then does it say in Hebrews if the wording doesn't mean destroyed? A good translation would be to use taken out of commission instead of destroyed. The word itself means to cause something to become unproductive or lose power, to have the power exhausted. That, however, is different than to say the devil is destroyed. His power is taken away. He's powerless. You can say that the power of the devil has been destroyed, but he still lives forever. There's a fiery place of torment that is reserved just for him. So what's being said here is that Jesus through his own death, took away that power that the devil had, which was of death, eternal death or torment for those who stand condemned. Through the one death of Jesus Christ, death was conquered. And for those who place their faith in him, they are released from the curse of death. The condemnation spoke of in John chapter 3, where it's written in uh, verse 18, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe, believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He who believes is not condemned because the one who held the power of death is defeated, not destroyed. 
but made powerless, incapable of exerting his previous power. It doesn't mean that he has no power. It doesn't mean that he is no longer a liar or a murderer. John 8, verse 44 says, you are, uh, or you are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But the devil has no power over those who are saved by Christ. Why? Because... Jesus gives aid to his people. Now in verse 16, we see that he, that is Jesus Christ, gives aid to the seed of Abraham. And in this case, the writer does refer to the actual biological seed of Abraham. That's the Jews. What this is noting is that not only the seed of Abraham receives this God-given aid, but it is showing that the seed of Abraham also as well um, is aided as well as the Gentiles. And that this aid that they receive needs to come from Jesus Christ alone. Both the Jews and the Gentiles are given aid because they cannot be saved without it. And so it is written in verse 17 that Jesus had to be, be made like his brethren in all things. So he became a seed of Abraham, a child of the covenant of God, and in his death fulfilled that covenant, becoming the foundation of your salvation. In life, he became this child of Abraham so that in death he could be your true, merciful, and faithful high priest. The one who goes to God for you. Through his death, he made a sacrifice for all mankind. He shed his blood and he sprinkled it upon the heavenly altar for all the people, but only those that put their faith in him as the Son of God are taken out from under the power of the devil. Because through his blood, he made expiation and propitiation for your sins. Our translations tend to use one word or the other, and there are those that say, oh, it's got to be propitiation, it can't say expiation. And then there are those that use expiation and say, well, it shouldn't be propitiation. And you may have heard people arguing back and forth about which word should be used, and the truth of the matter is, is that both are very important. Both are are necessary in the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ because expiation refers to Jesus' action on behalf of his people. Propitiation refers to the end result, if you will. Expiation refers to the atonement for sin. In other words, the payment of the penalty due for your sins. In expiation, Jesus pays the price you owe. That's what Christ did in carrying your sins to the cross. He made satisfaction for your sins. He paid the price of death so that you wouldn't have to. And he washed away the stain of sin. You can think of expiation like exit. The sins exited. In expiation, you are made clean. The sin is removed. Propitiation, on the other hand, has to do with placating the wrath of God. It's all about making God, your heavenly Father, Father, favorably inclined to you. You can't have propitiation without expiation. If you had expiation by itself, it wouldn't matter because you'd sin tomorrow. And this propitiation is also done through the death of Christ. That he becomes your high priest and sprinkles his own blood upon the altar of God. 
It's through the suffering of Jesus Christ that you are made acceptable to God the Father. So both expiation and propitiation are performed in the same act of death. The text this morning leans more closely toward the act of expiation, actually, and the atonement of your sins. And there was no need for the author of of Hebrews to go into depth to explain this because it's something that every Jew was familiar with because the idea of atonement was integral to the temple cultic. And the cultic's just a meaning for the religious practices. It's the religious rituals of the temple, the religious rituals of the Jews. Nor was it necessary to explain what the job of the high priest was. The high priest was the intermediary between man and God. If you think of the Old Testament prophets taking information from God to the people, the high priest, on the other hand, performed his work on behalf of the people to God. His major duty once each year on the Day of Atonement was to sprinkle blood, uh, the blood of the sacrifice on the horns of the altar of God at the temple. He would take blood into the mercy seat. What was forgotten by many at the time was that all of the sacrifices of the temple were done to point to the necessity of Christ. Christ simply meaning Messiah, or the anointed one of God. But the Jews had convinced themselves that they didn't need a suffering servant, as found in Isaiah 53. They were looking for the conquering Christ, not realizing that both were needed, because they were ignoring part of the witness of God's word. This is something that we must continue to remember today, that it is the full counsel of God that matters. Not just one book, not just one testament, but the full counsel of God's Word. One or two verses taken out of context can be made to say almost anything. The one or two verses or the book we like the best is not ever the full counsel of the Word of God. The Jews weren't so much misinterpreting Scripture as they were picking and choosing which parts of the Word of God to follow. Christ Jesus came to aid His people, to bring them salvation. And that means that He had to be tempted, tested. He had to suffer. And He had to die for His people. Sadly, there are those that refuse to seek first the kingdom of God. You know in your heart that without the will of God drawing you to Him, through love and mercy, you wouldn't seek Him either. That is why it's written in Romans 3, Therefore, by deeds of the law, by deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in His sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because of His forbearance. God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the, at the present time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And that is the lesson of Hebrews as well. It's so easy for one, someone to say that they're a Christian, It's so easy for someone to sit in a church every Sunday and figure that they'll go to heaven. But if you don't have faith in Jesus Christ, which means having faith in the Word of God, heaven is just a fairy tale. Told to make people feel better about death as they say he's gone to a better place. 
It's only through faith in Jesus Christ as the incarnate Son of God that true salvation is received and a better place is actually achieved. The author of Hebrews was writing this down so that these Jewish Christians wouldn't fall away from the true Christian faith and would continue to trust in Christ Jesus for salvation. Rather than falling back upon a trust in the law of God. We read the law of God most Sundays. But it's to remind us that we cannot measure up, not to remind us that we are under the law. Putting trust in the law is putting trust in being good enough, which is something else that Romans 3 clearly denies in saying there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. See, this message to Jewish Christians is just as important to Christians today because there are many who consider themselves to be good enough because they're nice people. They give their time and wealth away to help the needy, to create museums, to further knowledge. They seem to walk the walk and talk the talk, but in their hearts, they are whitewashed tombs. The Pharisees walked the walk. They talked the talk. But they were whitewashed tombs. They were empty vessels because they lacked faith. They had plenty of faith in their own ability, but they didn't have faith in the mercy of in the grace of God. And they couldn't see his Messiah when he came. The truth of the matter is you cannot save yourself. That's what the idea of being good enough is. It's what works righteousness is. The idea that you can save yourself. The truth of the matter is that the Lord has prepared a place for each and every person that has or will ever live on this earth. And sadly, some have a place prepared for themselves in what we call hell. It is by no means a better place. Only Christ Jesus can save you from that destination and prepare a place for you in his kingdom, a kingdom of light rather than darkness. He is faithful to do so, but it is all about faith in Christ. It's not about which sin you committed. It's not about how bad the sin you committed is. It's not about whether or not you're still sinning, because we all are. It's about having faith in Christ the Lord unto salvation. Christ came to suffer for you no matter who you are. Throughout his whole life on this earth, he put aside his unfathomable glory. He suffered ridicule and hurt for you. He was beaten and killed for you, every single one of you. Look again with me at Isaiah 53. It said, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As we hid, as it were, our faces from Him, He was despised and we did not esteem Him. Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him and by His stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. 
yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers was silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. It's because of that plight that he lived a life of turmoil for you. It's because of that death that he died for you, that he's able to aid you, that he's able to save you. He was tempted for you so that He can aid you in your temptation. So that He can help you conquer those temptations and rise above for Him. Jesus has made Satan himself powerless against you. The one who held the power of death over your head. So much ancient literature speaks of dualism and, and the fact that you know there's this good God and a bad God and they're equal and they're fighting against each other but that is not the case. The case is that God is above all and that Christ is God and Christ conquered Satan. The same one, Satan, who made the life of Job a living hell is made powerless against you. Because your adversary is conquered by Christ, his sacrifice, his substitutionary atonement, dying in place of you so that you don't have to die. Yes, Christ Jesus did die for all mankind, but the only ones who are saved are those who place their faith in him. Those who are elect into life. Come. Place your faith in Jesus Christ. Kneel before Him and know Him as your Lord and Savior. The author of your salvation is the creator and sustainer of all things. He is the one who seeks you out and brings you home into His kingdom. Do you hear that call on your heart? Come. Come. Don't kick against the goads. Don't fight against the call. As is written in Colossians, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. It's Colossians 1, 13 and 14. Embrace Him with all that you are, body, mind, soul, and He will take you out of the darkness and place you in the kingdom of light, the kingdom of the Son of His love, washed free from the stain of sin, which brings death. Come and kneel before your Savior and your God through Jesus Christ. Your sins are forgiven. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so blessed, so honored to have your word, to have your truth, to know that Satan is powerless against those who believe. Heavenly Father, bless us as we go forth today. Bless us as we live a life for you. Bless us 
as we proclaim your truth and know that the fiery darts of the devil will never take us down. For we are yours through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy 